before I get into the message, I would like to say, pray for those who get discouraged. I got a call yesterday and a dear brother who I thought was on the right track two months ago called me in the things that he was saying I was disturbed. I was like, wait a minute, I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. What happened? And I guess because of the distractions that we have in our life, we can easily, you know, allow things to anger us and we can lose faith or get distracted. And that's what had happened after the conversation. He was calm. He seemed to be back on course. But I say pray for those who, I won't say weak in the faith, but can easily be distracted and be discouraged. And um, it really bothered me to see that because I thought he was on the right track. And um, just pray for him. I'm not going to mention his name, but just pray for him. Before we get into the message, let us have a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have to study your word. We thank you, Father, for the message that you have given me to share. And Father, I pray that all, the, all who are here will realize that this message is also for me. Uh, Father, help people to realize that you are still talking to those who are uh, leaders in the church, deacons, elders, pastors, preachers, etc. And the message that is spoken is for everyone. Help us, dear God, to hear the message. Help us not just to hear it, but fill us with the desire to practice and apply it and to share with others in love. In Jesus' name, amen. This message is a little similar to one of the messages I had spoke some time ago, but I made some changes. Let us open our Bibles to the book of John. John, I'll be reading from John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I titled this message, Jesus, the Lamb, and the Beast. Jesus, the Lamb, and the Beast. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 14 and 15 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So before man, everyone beheld, in heaven beheld the glory of God, of the Son. The Bible tells us of a battle that happened in heaven. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And it says, And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against a dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. And the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There was no place for the devil and his angels in heaven. They were cast out. And so where were they cast out? To the earth. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye curse, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now this fire that the Bible is speaking about, this fire is not for human beings. Am I right or am I wrong? It says, this fire, everlasting fire, is prepared for the devil and his angels, so human beings should not be worried about this fire. It's prepared for spiritual beings. 
So heaven was the first battle, and we saw an angel in rebellion challenge God, particularly the Son of God. As a matter of fact, when we look at that text, the battle between Michael and his angels, Jesus has another name, and his name is Michael. Jesus is not an angel, but he is over the angels. And he was engaging in a battle between the devil and his angels. And the devil and his angels were cast out. Heaven has no place for those who do not love and those who not enjoy peace. Heaven is a place where the fruits of the Spirit are on display. Let's look at those for a minute. Chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and meekness, and temperance. Now, what are the opposite of these things? The Bible says, Against these there is no law. So let's look at the opposite of love, hate. The opposite of joy, misery. The opposite of peace, conflict, chaos, and anarchy. Instead of long-suffering, impatience and complaining. Have you ever met someone that complains all the time? Does it bother you? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Instead of gentleness, you have unkindness and brutality. Instead of goodness, you have meanness and wickedness. Instead of faith, you have mistrust. And instead of meekness and humility, you have those who are prideful and boastful and arrogant. Instead of temperance, you have self-indulgence and no self-control. And so in heaven, God had harmony. And when these angels rebelled, we saw all the other things that are opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. And so the dragon was cast out, and his destiny was sealed. Nothing he could do once he was thrown out, nothing he could do could get him back into heaven. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall ye say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye curse, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, I say that the fire is not meant for human beings. So we see this conflict in heaven. But we also see this conflict come down to the earth. And what we also see when this conflict is when man engages in this warfare, that God gives him a chance and he gives them chance after chance after chance after chance. God giving man the opportunity to make things right. God always seems to give man the opportunity to make things right. Man can do a 180. Can't do a 360 because you'd be in the same place you were before. So God wants us to do a 180 if we mess up or make a mistake. God gave us the power of choice. We can choose the direction in which we want us to go. Now, to me, that's a good God. Amen. When you look at society, and it's coming to it right now where you're not going to have much of a choice, and they're not suggesting that you make a choice except their choice. Yeah. One of my favorite writers, she says this in regards to the conflict. She said, those who are with Christ have the mind of Christ and work the works of Christ. They are ever improving, ever drawing nearer to God, ever uplifting the soul to Jesus by beholding the world's Redeemer. They become changed into his image. A new spiritual life is created, a new motive power supplied. When one is fully emptied of self, when every false god is cast out of the soul, the vacuum is supplied by the inflowing of the Spirit of Christ. Such as one has the faith which works by love and purifies the soul from every moral spiritual defilement. 
the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, can work upon the heart, influencing, directing, so that he enjoys spiritual things. So what is that telling us? That if we are following Christ, a total change can come over our lives. Do we believe that? It continues. It says, He, I'm sorry, uh, see. the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, can up, work upon the heart, influencing, directing, so that He enjoys spiritual things. He is after the Spirit, and He minds the things of the Spirit. He has no confidence in self. Christ is all in all. Truth is constantly being unfolded by the Holy Spirit. He receives with meekness the engrafted word, and he gives the Lord all the glory, saying, God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. Amen. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. I'm going to stop there in a quote. And so this is what we or any human being can experience. Those who have the Spirit will be earnest laborers. In other words, they will work for Christ. They will not work against Christ. They will work for Christ. When we look at what happened in heaven, the very foundation was shaken. Everything originally was perfect. Everything was in harmony, in perfect harmony. When we look at the earth, everything was made perfect. Everything was in harmony. God had given man over the earth, dominion over the earth, and he could only, and this dominion can only be maintained by obedience. As a result of violating God's law, then the other part comes in, the chaos and all the confusion and the disunity. Jesus was the first teacher, and he made it absolutely clear to Adam and Eve what would happen if they were not to obey. But if they were to obey, God had promised life and life more abundantly. They were to live forever. Obedience, the obedience, loving God, oh, sorry about that, the obedience... If they were obedient and they were loving God, they would have harmony forever. God had given them a choice. You can do what you want or you can do what I want. Is God fair? As long as they follow God, there would be harmony. But notice, when you look at the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve failed, to meet that requirement. What does God do for Adam and Eve? Jesus goes and he's walking in the midst of the garden. And he finds them. Their world had been shattered. And so Jesus finds them and what does he do? He found Adam and Eve covered in fig leaves and what does he do? He makes the first sacrifice of a lamb. And then he gives them a robe of animal skin. What does that robe represent? A robe of righteousness. He could have left them and said, I told you you were going to die and it's over, but God did not do that. He gave them a robe. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, And also all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So something had to die for the error or the mistake that they had made. And so the lamb dies. And the lamb points to Jesus. The penalty for breaking God's law was death. Here we saw an animal suffer for Adam and Eve. An innocent lamb. The lamb was to be a symbol that was to point to Jesus, the one who could actually pay the price for sin or bad choices. 
when we look at the lamb, this symbol was to forever point to Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, which is our opening text, John chapter 1, verse 29. Let's go there for a moment. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. This is he whom I said, After me cometh a man which preferred before me, for he was before me. The Lamb of God was supposed to take away the sins of the world. The purpose of Jesus was not only supposed to take away the sins of the world, but he was supposed to destroy the works of the devil. When we look at Jesus as the Lamb of God, did Jesus remain perfect? Did Jesus ever sin? Did Jesus do everything by himself? Or did Jesus have help? John chapter 14, verses 10, it says, Believeth thou that I am the Father, and the Father in me, this is Jesus talking, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. So the Father assisted Jesus. Did anyone else help Jesus? Luke chapter 2, verses 29, 39 and 41 it says here, and when he had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee in their own city of Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. His parents were God-fearing, church-going folks. His parents helped him in his development. Who else helped Jesus in his development and to stay faithful? The Holy Spirit. Matthew three sixteen it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. So the Holy Spirit assisted Jesus. Jesus. The angels assisted Jesus. The Father assisted Jesus. What about us? Who's going to assist us? Do we believe that the Father can assist us? Do we believe that the Holy Spirit can help us? I hope so. And I believe they can. Heavenly angels didn't just do everything for Jesus. The Father didn't just do everything for Jesus. We have to realize that there was cooperation. Jesus cooperated with heavenly agencies. And we as people of God or people who are not of God all have to cooperate with heavenly agencies. When a person thinks of a lamb or the characteristics of a lamb, they don't think much of that lamb. What are words that you hear when you talk about a lamb? Some people say the lamb is dumb. You know, uh, they say he's, he's, he's fearful. He doesn't do much. But when you think of Jesus as a lamb, what do you think of? Someone who's humble. The lamb that was supposed to be sacrificed is an animal... Um, it's an, the lamb is, he's not, a, well, he becomes a sheep after one year old. So this is a, like a babe. And so this babe needs guidance. We are referred to as lambs, are we not, in the Bible? Do we not need guidance? Absolutely. Jesus, when you look at Jesus in his life, we realize by reading the word of God, that Jesus was spotless and perfect and didn't have any blemishes. He was in good health. He was treated with kindness and he remained in good health and he remained without spot and without blemish. One man's observation, one man was looking on one day 
and he went to this water hole and he noticed that a shepherd shows up and the shepherd shows up and he has his flock flock goes over and they begin to drink the water and then he noticed another shepherd shows up and he has a flock and they go over and drink the water and another shepherd shows up with flock and another shows up with the flock and so the man wonders he's looking and he sees he says how are those sheep going to know where to go after they finish drinking the water with all of these well lambs how are they going to know and so one shepherd stood up and he spoke and his flock followed him and the next shepherd stood up and he spoke and the flock followed him his flock not anyone else's flock and it began to go on until all the shepherds were gone with their flock and there was no mix up you see the lambs knew the voice of the shepherd and so that way they knew who to follow I'm also reminded of a story not actually a story it's something that happens almost every year since 1877 in 1877 they started this contest and uh, people would come year after year. I think the only year they probably missed was COVID. <laughs> but as a child, I thought this was the most boringest thing I ever saw. And I was wondering, why is this on a sports channel? It's called the Westminster Dog Show. <laughs> and I would watch this, and I was like, I don't understand. Why is this on a sports channel? But as I begin to watch, I begin to see things, and I begin to learn little lessons by watching this. You know, these, these dogs, they're like, they treated them like human beings. They had to have their nails cut, and their hair shampooed, and they were uh, pampered, and they were almost treated like human beings. And they would enter into this contest, and they was judged on agility and appearance and obedience. I, I, when I was out in California, I was shocked that um, uh, a lady confronted my wife and she said, are you going to take your dog to dog obedience school? And I was like, I didn't know there was such a school. But they actually teach dogs obedience. And at this, um, this contest, you can see that the best of the best animals would be there. And you can believe that an animal who had just chased down a cat and got into a fight would not make it in the door. And so these animals would come in and their, their owners would come in and whatever their owners told them to do, they would do. They would jump through hoops and roll on the floor and sit down and sit up and they would follow everything the owner had told them to do. The key is to win the contest, they had, not, they, they had to be so disciplined that they could not be distracted by another owner or another dog. And so you would see some of these dogs had like records. They'd won so many contests and so many things like that. And they were in this contest and only the best dogs would win. And so I saw that and I realized, you know what? There's a little lesson in that. You know, those dogs and the owner, they had developed a friendship. And that friendship had turned into something else. It turned into a relationship and then a partnership. You win, I win. And this is how it is with Christ. We have to, or man has to have a friendship. And that friendship could turn into a relationship. And that relationship turns into a partnership. And most of us who are married, we're familiar with this. You know, if you're married to somebody who's not a friend, you got problems. <laughs> God doesn't want us to have problems. That's right. He wants to have peace in our home love and harmony and happiness <laughs> when we look at the lamb we can see many things the lamb as we look at the lamb as Jesus we can see many things that he has done from the beginning of the garden of Eden when you look at at the creation the, one of the first things that seem like the lamb does he has face to face contact with Adam and Eve and he warns them of the danger after they sin he goes to them and he comforts them and he allows them and helps them to make things right. That's a loving God and a caring God. When you see the lamb in the New Testament, you see him 
healing the nobleman's son, the man with the unclean spirit, Simon's mother-in-law. He heals the paralytic. He heals the man at the pool of Bethesda. He always seems to be healing. And those who are possessed by demons in Jairus' daughter, he's always healing. And I wonder sometimes, how come people don't believe in Jesus Christ when he's always healing? If you have a problem, he can heal you. The blind man, the mute, the possessed man, the daughter of, of Canaanite, the deaf man, the blind man in, in Bethesda, the, the boy with ep, the what is it? epileptic boy, the man born blind. All these instances are, when we look at them, we can see what God can do, not only for them, but he can also do for us. What's amazing to me, when you look at the story of all these healing, most of these people came to Jesus. How did they know that Jesus could heal them? How did they know? But the Lamb just doesn't do that. He shows us his power. When we go to Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 and 27, and Mark chapter 4, verse 37 and 41, and also in the book of Luke, we see Jesus calms the storm. We see the power that God has. He feeds the 5,000. He walks on water. Then he feeds 4,000. And then he gets coins out of a fish's mouth. And when the disciples couldn't catch fish, he went out there and he caught so many fish they could barely pull them in. And today, people don't believe in Jesus. How many times has God multiplied your little bit? How many times when you felt like there's no way I'm going to be able to pay this rent and give my tithe and God multiplied what you had? I had some friends in Alabama. They would, at the end of the year, they would go to pay their taxes. And the man was doing the taxes and said, how in the world did you make it off this little bit of money right here? And they said, well, we gave our money. You know, we gave our money, uh, we paid, gave our tithe, and the Lord blessed. And uh, one of my other friends, they went and they said, how did you make it? They filed their taxes, and they got a return back. Even though they had very little, they still got a return back. And they couldn't understand how we getting a return back. God works things out to his honor and to his glory. What we see here, those who had come to Jesus heard his voice and they knew his voice. When we look at Adam and Eve and others, they knew the voice of God. And the question that comes to mind is when we have rough times or when man has rough times, does he know the voice of God? It's a good question. God is a solution to all of our problems. Amen. People think, oh, COVID is bad. God's a solution. Amen. The variance is bad. God is a solution. Amen. Why are we fearing if God is the solution? Genesis 4 through 6 shares a story with us. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole story. But Genesis shares a story with us. That's uh, about Cain and Abel. These were sons of Adam and Eve. And what happened between them was God asked him to bring a sacrifice. And so uh, Cain brought his best and Abel brought his best. But I think they both realized that without the remission, of the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so Abel brought a lamb and Cain brought fruit and God did not accept what he had brought and so Cain gets angry and so his brother tries to say hey all you have to do and the angels tried to tell Cain all you have to do is just repent and do what God says and as a result Cain gets so angry 
He didn't want to do. He thought God was unfair. He didn't accept his sacrifice. He didn't accept his gift. He got so angry that he killed his brother. If you look at what's happening today, this same thing is brewing in our world. There are those who are getting upset with Christians and people who are making choices. And it should not be. Revelation 13, 11 through 18. Let's go there. Revelation 13, 11 through 18. In Revelation 13, 11 through 18, it starts out and it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So, so far we have talked about Jesus. We have talked about the Lamb. And here in Revelation 13, 11 through 18, it starts out and it says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he has two horns like a lamb. And then it says he spoke like a dragon. And I asked earlier, do we know the voice of God? Notice what this two horn like a lamb power does. It says here, he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused of the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now when we study Bible prophecy, we know who the beast was before this power. We know who this beast was. It was paper Rome. And so this beast here has two horns like a lamb, and when we think of lamb, we think of Christ, but he doesn't speak like a lamb. So if he's not speaking like a lamb, why should anybody follow him? It says here in verse 13, it says, He doeth great wonders, so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and I hope you catch this, that the image of the beast should live, should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, did you catch that last part? Now, we're going to go down to the last verse, um, 17, and it says, And that no man might by herself say, He that have the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And I had a question as I was reading this. I said, "What? Well, now, this is kind of Olympic time, and everybody's patriotic, you know. Um, if you're from Jamaica, you're cheering on the Jamaicans in the Olympics, you know. If you're from America, you're cheering on the Americans. But God is revealing to us what might happen in this country. We're not anti-country, but God is telling us what might happen in this country will happen in this country. And what it's saying here, that one day this power will make an image to the beast and expect you to bow down to that image. And I ask again, do you know the voice of the Lamb? Because here is a power that basically puffs himself up and says, hey, I'm, I have, there's two horns like a lamb, we're like Christ, but he speaks like a dragon. It's something in this text that really bothered me when I think of uh, verse 15. And it says, And he had power to give life to the image of the beast. And the image of the beast is actually a church and state system united. America is a church and state system separate. Um, Papal Rome was a church and state system united where the Pope was over it. And he dictated to everybody what they would do in regards to worship, in regards to politics. So it says here in 15, and, I had, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. But in verse 17, notice it says, and that no man might buy or sell. If you're stopping someone from buying and selling, why would you kill them? What will eventually happen to the person who's not buying or selling? They would die anyway. Am I right? You know, there, there's a crisis that's, that's playing out in our world today. And they're saying, 
If you don't have a master, you can't buy or sell. If you don't get vaccinated, you won't be able to buy or sell. We don't know where this is leading, but it sounds really familiar what's happening here. But my question was always, well, wait a minute. If we're going to die out anyway, why are you going to kill me? <laughs> doesn't make any sense. <laughs> then it says, save he that hath the mark of the beast. So in other words, it's saying, if you don't do as I say, and remember, this is this power is lamb-like. Basically, this power is demanding worship, standing in the place of God saying, if you don't do what I say, if you don't receive my mark, you're going to die. Now, when we go back to the beginning of the sermon, when those, Adam and Eve, Cain and others, when they rebelled against God, even Lucifer, did they die instantly? Did he kill them? Absolutely not. When we sin, do we die instantly? Most cases, no, we don't, do not. But this power dares to say, if you don't follow what I say, I'm going to kill you. And I ask, are we listening to this two horn like a lamb, or are we listening to the lamb of God? Because some people today, what they're saying is, you need to do what the, this power says, and if you don't do it, I'm going to turn you in. Is that a Christian? Absolutely not. But we're hearing, and we're hearing this, and it's gonna, it seems to me it's going to swell and it's not going to stop. And people are going to get to the point where they're going to say, hey, this person didn't do what the government says. And you can put them to death. Now, if you have someone put them to death, aren't you also responsible for killing that person? Is that a violation of, a thing, of one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not kill? So today, who is society really listening to? Are they listening to the Lamb of God, or are they listening to this two-horn-like-a-lamb power? I'm concerned about what's going on, because I hear Christians are standing up today and saying that, you know what, we should unite the church and the state. And if you study your history, you would know what happened when church and state unite. Persecution. God's people get persecuted. And there are those today who are so close in their teaching and their thoughts, they're saying basically, hey, you better do what they tell you to do. When we look at this, when we look at Revelation 13 and 18, what happens to those who receive the mark? Are they not cast out eventually by God like Satan was? So you're really not having life. You're actually losing life and life eternal. What is God saying? God is simply saying that we need to understand and know the voice of the Lamb. The only way we can hold on and make it in this world if we know the Lamb. We have to know His voice. Today many are not hearing the voice. Once you hear his voice, listen to the voice, establish a relationship with the voice or with him, with God. Establish a friendship, a relationship, and then a partnership. That's the only way God's people are going to make it. I'm going to close. You know, we can't believe everything we hear on television. I, I, I just have to put it that way. Some people would say to a Christian, where did you get that information you're talking about from? And you say, the Bible. It's from the Word of God. And they say, well, I don't believe in God. But yet they will say, we'll ask them, where did you get your information? And they'll say, well, I got it from television. <laughs> now, who are you going to trust? Those who are speaking on television... Are you going to believe those who are coming from the Word of God, teaching the Word of God? Who are you going to believe? God wants us 
to listen to his voice. And the only way we can know his voice from anybody else is as we study this right here. Amen. That's the only way. Amen. We're coming up on a time when now well, we have to trust God. If you don't trust him, you will fear, you will shake, you will do anything this other voice is telling you to do, and you're going to lose your salvation. Amen. I don't mean to put it blunt, blunt but I, you know. God wants us to listen to him. And Amen. I want to close with this. Many people say, I've talked to people online, and they say things like this. They say things like this. Well, God is not fair because if I don't do what he says, he's going to kill me. <laughs> but is that really true? God is asking you to do what he wants you to do to protect you. Amen. And so some people get it kind of mixed up. They get it twisted. The enemy is telling you to do what he wants you to do for what reason? Eventually, he's going to kill you. And so people have to understand there is a difference. God protects. God loves. God wants unity. And God wants harmony. And he wants, that to bring, he wants to bring that into your life. We're going to have our closing song and then I'll have us bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have spent with you today. We thank you, Father, for giving me the message that you have given me to share with others. Father, I know that this applies to me and it applies to everyone. Help us, Father, to hear your voice. Help us, Father, to continue to read your word and to study your word. Help us, Father, to develop the faith that will not be shaken. We know in these trying times, things will come before us. But help us, Father, to stand and help us to help others to stand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.